You walk into the sunlight to make yourself happy. This is the poem that will tell you how to live. It's set in Paris, so you'll eat a croissant to make yourself happy. Here, we utter hexameters rarely. We do confuse what is a command and what a prayer, statement and threat, question and answer. Animals utter indivisible sounds so often, yet Aristotle does not call any of them a letter. Still, an animal sound will make yourself happy. Listen to this kitten. We can call its noises an alphabet without confusion. And here, you cannot be maimed by the muses. See leaves in the gutters and salted butter that stands in a bright rectangle of light like a small giraffe never melting in the sun, which is what you picture when your aim is to make yourself happy. You eat a lot of things to make yourself happy. Stick this piece of meat in your mouth to make yourself happy. It's a good one. The sounds of sirens outside the window are gay to the ear that tends to hear what it needs to make itself happy. An interesting thought about dirt or air or water will work to make yourself happy. Look from where you are inside the window, not where you want to be outside the window, i.e. to make yourself happy. This is the way we've come along the dusky boulevards like eager huskies taking big steps, eating up the sidewalks with our big stepping, big licking legs, making ourselves happy. Tomorrow, we'll learn all the things to undo in the making ourselves happy school. First, the heroine never moves towards death. And then imagine the poem that Anne Lauterbach read, <laughs> like having an orgasm in your happy. I bought something. It was a fancy thing. The man called me madam and opened the door with a swish. I was sure I had never been so happy to buy something. My feet felt happy, even though the thing was for my wrists. Probably many of us have had that experience. Okay, and um, so replacement poem for the one that Anne read for me. <laughs> I like how you read it. <laughs> um, this poem was written on the island of Lesbos, um, which, and I wrote it, I was there before all the, uh, the, constant arrival of immigrants. I'm sure Lesbos feels like a very different place now. But I um, did keep having the feeling that if I just glanced to the side, I would see Sappho somewhere. Um, and I was just with uh, the, um, the Greek scholar uh, Vasilis Lambo Lambropoulos, who's the Kavafi scholar, and he said... Um, <laughs> I loved it. He said, yeah, and, you know, we invented homose homosexuality, and look, they've named all these lesbians after us. <laughs> but, and Lesbos is the place where also a lot of lesbians live. If you're from Lesbos. What I mean and what I meadow, what I want and what I winnow, when I see it sappho biting into a sesame seed, she arrives right through the centuries, walked from Molivos to Petra, bright blossoms along the way, green fields, seaside, and some run-down stone houses among the hotels. Sappho, how's it going? Everything's great. I recognize the sun, but where have our gods gone? Never mind, so much hiding the meat, giving them the fat, 
Now I can piss in the garden. I can throw my book in the sea, drink my wine without wondering which meadow will winnow me, what girl like a rosy apple will, wa- will make me sweet-mouthed, happy. Here I am eating ordinary bread, leaping out of that terrible habitat, the past. I can pluck and pluck her maidenhead from the top of the present maidenhead tree. Did you know there was a maidenhead tree? (laughs) Yes, you did. Okay, so I'm going to move to the next section. I think I read in this room when I gave that reading a million years ago, actually, Yes, you're saying yes, Robert, yes. You're still here, I know. It's amazing. Um, this, this section is called How to Assemble the Animal Globe, and I guess one of the, I'm going to talk more than I usually do tonight about pro- the process of, of um, these books and projects, but um, one of the things I was thinking about was uh, wanting to poetry in particular the um, the lineages I feel a part of um, wanting them wanting to be able to address very very basic and simple questions in the poem like how to live or what is life um, how, and um, I in that process I was reading a book by the biologist Lynn Margolis do you guys know her work she's really amazing feminist biologist who pioneered the theory that evolution is not only was not only um, a clash of, of species but also a symbiotic relationship and everybody scoffed at her in the 70s and it's now been proven in our very cells by our mitochondria that there was also um, there were beneficial relationships that fueled evolution. Um, and, but anyway, in her, um, her book called What is Life, I came across the term autopoiesis, which was a term invented by two Chilean biologists. You guys know this? T- I see a lot of nodding. That's so fabulous. Um, and so poiesis is always exciting for poets um, because we uh, poies. I don't know. what's the f- how, do we, how do we conjugate that? But we make. It means to make. And autopoiesis means to self-make or self-produce. And Maturana and Varela, the Chilean biologist, felt that this was a kind of basic definition of what life is. It's the capacity to self-make or self-produce. So any cell, a, a uni- unicellular organism or us. And so seeking happiness being one of the ways that we self-make or self-produce. Um, and then, of course, you can't go very far along that thought line without thinking about how our autopoetic search uh, affects other creatures. So this section section is called How to Assemble the Animal Globe, and it first arrived as an image. And, and the image was of a globe that you could cut out of the book, and this has been in my suitcase for several weeks, um, and I didn't want to finish it because I wanted to show. So this is actually from the very copy I'm reading. You cut out the globe, and um, I used a mini stapler on this one. And on the other side are some of the poems, so you have to destroy the poems to make the globe, the animal globe. And then um, I've tried to track um, modern animal extinctions and those are what are written on the outside. And um, actually, I assembled this for a radio show. They asked me to bring it in, which I love because they couldn't see anything. I could just crinkle it and say, oh, I ha- this is what I have. <laughs> and so um, I was thinking about some of my documentary poetics forebears, like Charles Reznikoff and Norbese Phillips and many others who have worked with... Um, with fact and with document to try to um, come to, to make the real realer, let's say. And this is organized by continent. I'm just going to read a couple. And since some of us are studying birds, I'll read this Aldabra brush warbler, confirmed extinct 1986. Discovered in 1967. 
described in 1968, lost in 1969, found in 1975, gone in 1983. Stellar sea cow, first seen by Europeans near Bering Island in 1741, extinct by 1768. By night, lava spirits took to the skies to hunt and returned with a whale impaled on each enormous finger. Volcanoes lit up for the roasting. Captain Vitus Bering landed, scurvied in a storm, then died. As to his shipmates, the meat of the giant sea cow kept them alive. It drifted just below the surface of the water. A single animal resembled an overturned boat, and they stripped its skin for barks. The last cow was killed for its excellent meat. Had they been mistaken for sirens, would the flesh have been so sweet? Sappho said, someone will remember us. To be remembered means what if poetry is la mémoire de la langue, the sensory remnant, as if we could still taste it on our tongues. When self-making stops, Ops, Greek, I, turns wine dark into itself, as if twisted in the mirror. I, though, I see, eidolons, the ghosts, everywhere, worlds touch. And I'll read one more from this section. Ectopistus migratorius, which, Susan, do you know? I don't know where you are if you're here, but do you know what bird that is? Does anyone? Uh, ec, it, oh, I'll just tell you. It's a passenger pigeon. And, you know, it's funny. I feel like the knowledge of the passenger pigeon is like younger generations don't all know about that uh, bird. Younger people, do you know about that bird? <laughs> yes, no, yes, no. <laughs> um, it's, it was uh, a bird that was so present, it's native to this continent, and it was so present in, in the Midwest that it blackened the skies, actually. It deafened people, the, the, the great, great flocks of this bird. And um, people would go out and hunt them just and leave them in rotting piles. And so from those uh, flocks that blackened the skies, we went to absolutely zero passenger pigeons. The last passenger pigeon was Martha. She lived in the Cincinnati Zoo. She was what we call an endling, which means you're the last of your kind. And that's just such an incredible thing to think about, being the last of your species. She, she died in the Cincinnati Zoo, and then she was sent, her body was sent to the Smithsonian, and you can see her on display there. Not always, but often. And th there's actually, there's a tradition, American tradition of passenger pigeon poems, I recommend to you to read Laureen Niedecker. I mentioned her earlier. Read her great Lake Superior, and within that, there's a poem called Passenger Pigeon, and it goes... Does anyone know how it goes? No. Yes? No. I will tell you. It goes, Did not man, maimed by no stonefall, mash the cobalt and carnelian of that bird? Ectopesis migratorius, extinct, 1914. It begins with an Audubon quote. The dung fell in spots, not unlike melting flakes of snow, and the continued buzz of wings had a tendency to lull my senses to repose. Slave meat, hog meat, that cheap, sent more than a million pigeons to market from one roost. Trap, so a pigeon's eyes shut and let it cry, others will come. From flocks so great, they topple trees. 
In air, their massing backs a glistening sheet of azure, iridesce, and anon, at a turn, suddenly a rich, deep purple. In Kentucky, townsfolk talked and ate nothing but pigeon for a week. Even the air smelled of it. Of their courtship, the tenderness and affection displayed by these birds towards their mates are in the highest degree striking. See two birds billing. Their love songs, a monosyllabled string. Coo, 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 ki, 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 ki. The first note, the loudest, like a bell diminishing. And further into this thinking about autopoiesis, I began to think about other kinds of self-producing or self-contained structures, and so I started to think about other kinds of biospheres. And um, I happened to be in Arizona and went on a little trip to Biosphere 2 um, with... Um, a mutual friend, a, a poet and writer, Alison Hawthorne Deming. Do you guys know where Biosphere One is? You're right here. <laughs> we're always on it. I, I guess since we're not astronauts, we are always on Biosphere One. It's Earth. Um, and Biosphere Two is this self-contained project. Has anyone been there? Has anyone seen it? It's kind of amazing. It's these big glass houses, and there are at least... Sorry about the sound. If, is it better if I'm further away? It's okay? Okay. Um, and there are about seven biomes they tried to recreate, and they wanted to see what would happen when we run out of resources. And so, for example, if happiness is a resource, how do we recycle it? What happens? Um, but there, they were thinking about carbon exchange and so forth. Um, so there's, there's actually a tidal ocean, there is a high desert, and so forth. It was a massive, massive failure. They, they didn't think the project... Is it just me hearing that, or is it you? Yeah, okay. It's real! It's real! This is real! There's no alternative fact in this room! <laughs> um, so... Speaking of alternative facts, Steve Bannon was one of the uh, advisors on this project. That's only come to light later. I wrote this work, uh, I guess, probably six years ago. Um, and so it's interesting to think about um, creating a world in case the one we live in gets destroyed, and also creating a world that is colossally misplanned. So many, uh, I think of the 25 vertebrate, vertebrate species um, three or something, maybe five survived. They didn't think about the fact that hummingbirds, their mating dance, m most hummingbirds, they swoop way up, right, and then swoop down, and, but there's a glass ceiling there. Um, and so the first type of hummingbird did not survive. Um, so anyway, that was one of the um, sort of research pieces that went into thinking about this, but it's not the only thing. I was thinking about other kinds of um, enclosed biospheres and um, and I was thinking about language as a resource that gets recycled, too. And maybe I'll talk more about that in a minute. This is one long section. It's, it's a bit, um, bit sci-fi. And I'm just going to hop around in it, and hopefully there'll be some coherence. No one knows how it began. A few atoms lying in the sun began to lick and burn. Then, man. How came we to be symmetry-breaking death? Luck, happiness, greed. We were like half the goddess's face as ash color, like the corpse, half blue-black where the blood collects. Make the sides of color come together 
licking the stitches of blue, as if the consonant were its black and the vowels were its white. We can bring them back together, Edaltu. We know this because in the future we can peek through the body window and see the corpse, the dead inside the living, our mitochondrial Eve. In the laboratory of artificial anatomy, we work the living inside the dead, the wood and strings. It's a bit of flame folded up in the organs like a letter inside a drunk man's pocket. All we need is when to spark it. Some crows lost their caw, their predator warning. Their predators were gone. We lost some vowels down in the bowels, the organ chambers where meaning rounds itself toward night, a light. Shared aggregates, mineral iridium, irresidue, smacked us come, smacked us come, the reactor, nuclear, oh, heart atom, oh, come. Put the originals, namely the animals around us, all the plants, back into time somewhere for safekeeping. We had taken them out. First, the animals disappeared, their sounds, then their names. We had forgotten their faces. Their faces are not our faces. So the likeness is to the thing that it is like. I like, like having lions around. Only lions can lie here on this part of other earth. Our last zebra, hypertext transfer not found. Our last long-fingered frog, hypertext transfer not found. Our last fruit bat, our last angel shark. Put them in the oracle, shark, ark, ark. Put them in the leaky coracle. Put the letters in the tin can and rattle them around. Angel sounds like a loud shark. Gathering up the atoms to find a woman who rhymes with time. To find all the letters in the t -grr. They sought to erase from my face all evidence that I had lived. They used needles to do it, extraction methods and plumping. Ocean makes a slurry sound behind my head, a O oh sound. It was silent as the atoms were gathering, then it got noisy. Sound made the ocean make sound and we found history on the earth's wrinkled face. Seen a woman who rhymed with time. Does her decay, does her primordial radionuclide dress and its disintegrating daughters do time? When you peel off your dead skin to see the face of the world, the already dead go deathly pale. Self is a god we walked through. I was an idiot. It was a mistake. I believe something here. What self? I do not believe the man-made sky. I think like a hero. I think like a dog. I was looking for the real sky. I want more face, more mother, more atoms moving through the heart. Get ready. I am taking man back for woman, mankind. Sound stops, I use waste 
world to word waste to build it, oracle. Spine lost its E, might lost its Y, four lost its M at the end of pun. Spin the carousel round again. Shirred aggregates, mineral, iridium, irresidue, smacked us come, smacked us come, the ractor, nuclear, heart, atom, oh, come. At the end of time, spin the carousel round again. Smacked us come, smacked us come, the ractor, nuclear, heart, tum, come. <laughs>